right. Let's see here. Let's do this. So thank you, Jeremy. And uh, let me get this a little closer here. There we go. How's that? Off to a good start. All right, thank you, Jeremy, and thank you to Creative Mornings for having me out today. But most of all, thanks to all of you for getting up early on a Friday morning and uh, showing up for this amazing view and this amazing venue. Uh, did anyone get lost on their way here today? No, 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 no. Well, as long as I don't lose any of you during the presentation, we're going to call this a success, OK? <laughs> In all seriousness, though, uh, when I heard that this month's theme was lost, I got really excited. You see, I've been trying to get lost for a very long time. In fact, I try to get lost daily. And not because I don't want to ever arrive where it is that I'm going, but because it's not until we lose ourselves in the moments that we can really be fully immersed in what we're doing or making. Now, I find it very coincidental that last month's theme was flow. And you see, I see flow as sort of a similar concept to getting lost. And while flow is more about increased productivity and mental state allowing for higher levels of output, I like to look at Lost as sort of getting uh, more into something so you can be more about the discovery and exploration and passion of it, right? It's the feeling-based yin to Flo's productivity-based yang. They're wildly different, but they go great together. And so today, I'm going to share with you the story of a mid-20-something who was having a difficult time catching a break and how a little determination and creativity helped to not only solve his dilemma, but also create some of the most crazy, awesome moments and projects, as well as multiple communities where others could be provided with the same opportunities. And no, the story is not about Eminem. You can go rewatch 8 Mile for that. Uh, this story is a story of my own experiences. However, the sentiment here is completely mutual. I have always loved getting lost in the music, those special once-in-a-lifetime concert performances, uh, the unique moments that, that seeing music live creates, being lost in a crowd of people all moving together with the music. And I didn't know it at the time, but there was one concert in the winter of 2009 that was going to change my life forever. At the time, I was working as a senior designer at McGuffin Creative Group, a boutique design agency in Chicago's West Loop. And I loved working there. They had this one statement in their ethos that I'll never forget, and I hope more companies grab onto. Your personal life will interrupt your work life. If it doesn't, something worse is happening. You're not living. And this type of compassion and support for living our best lives is why I stayed with the company for eight years. The partners truly supported passion projects and saw the value that living a well-rounded life would bring to our, our work at the company. And the perk of having every other Friday off year round there didn't hurt either. More companies should do that too. So, although I didn't focus on photography during my undergrad, it's a little bit further back there, but clearly I've always had this artistic vibe going, right? No. But uh, while, while I was in college, uh, and if you can't see, if you're sitting over on the sides, you know, feel free to scoot in. There's a lot of room in the front. We don't have cool blankets and cookies and milk and stuff, but you know, bring a taco up and have a seat in the front here. But uh, so while I was while I was in college, uh, the visual communications program that I attended provided me a strong foundation uh, for photography composition and layout using photography. And then during my professional career, I had been dabbling more and more with using photography of my own work in um, you know the photographic work or in the design work that I was doing at my job, and really like growing this hobby and getting really excited about photography. And then uh, it was right around this time that a really good friend of mine named Mary O'Donnell, she goes, hey, man, I'm going to go see Andrew Bird performing at this uh, church up on North Michigan Avenue. And I was like, what, Andrew Bird in a church? Yeah, I want to go with. Of course I want to go with. That sounds amazing. This was going to be the most, like, the, the coolest little venue to see Andrew Bird and his, like, really rich music. And, uh, and then, it, you know, I was thinking, well, with photography, my photography hobby growing, wouldn't it be cool to take photos at this show and really have something that me and her could remember this moment forever with? And uh, so I did the most logical thing. I went on the band's website and uh, looked up any contacts, any emails I could find, wrote them an email, and you know, saying, hey, I'd really like to shoot this show. To which I got a very quick reply, and they were like, yeah, sure thing, we'll put you on the list. <laughs> what? <laughs> All right, cool. That sounds great. I'm really excited about this. But what, what's this list they're talking about? I, I didn't really know at the time, but all would be revealed in the days to come. So I show up at the show, uh, sweet venue. You know, you get right up front and start capturing images of one of my favorite musicians. 
And this show is amazing. I couldn't believe that I hadn't been doing more of this type of work sooner. I thought for sure, from this point forward, I was gonna email every band. <laughs> like, why the hell have I not been doing this sooner? And so my journey into concert photography began. I wanted to capture these moments in a way that me and everyone else could relive them and get lost in them over and over again. The problem was, I didn't really have a clue about the industry or what I was gonna be up against. Time and time again, as I was reaching out to band after band, email after email, I was getting the same response. What do you shoot for? I'm thinking, well, me, I shoot for me. Like, <laughs> duh, you know? <sighs> so I felt just like Crew Jones from the 1980s BMX racing movie, Rad. Has anyone seen that movie? A couple? Yeah, it's kind of cult culture. I don't know, a lot of people probably haven't seen it, but if you haven't, I'd totally go check it out. The, the woman from Full House is in it, too. Really old. <laughs> Um, anyways, uh, so I felt just like Crew Jones from the 1980s BMX racing movie Rad, because he's trying to race this thing called Hell Track. It's like this total come up story of this underdog, right? And, uh, and he gets the, all these blockers keep coming in his way. And at one point, the guys who are organizing the festival, they're like, oh, well, you need to be sponsored now. And he's showing up for the qualifying runs, and they're saying, oh, no, you, you got to have a sponsor. And he's like, what? But I ride for me. I ride for me. And I'm thinking, oh, it's the same thing. And, and so all hope had seemed lost for crew, and hope was dwindling for me as well. You know, uh, I'd been reaching out to all these uh, publications and media outlets, and every time I kept getting the same response, you know, come back when you have a portfolio. Okay, total chicken and egg thing happening here, right? How do you get the portfolio if you don't have the opportunities, vice versa? Uh, so even though I had some images from this Andrew Bird show, it wasn't gonna be enough to get my foot in any of these doors that I needed to to continue on this, creating these moments that myself and others could get lost in. And so just like when Crew Jones' friends started the Rad Racing clothing line that ultimately became his sponsor and allowed him to race and win Helltrack, I thought, shit, I'm a designer. I'll make my own publication. <laughs> That's what we do, right? We create things. So after some time at the drawing board, Lost in Concert was born. There's a couple pins over by the water. If you haven't grabbed one, there's a few left. But, uh, so I rounded up a few like-minded friends, and we started covering the smallest and crappiest venues around town. Uh, these, were, these were the only places that would let us in at the time, right? Uh, you know, we didn't have a real, a real publication that we were shooting for. This is a long time ago. But we needed more content for the site, and we needed anything that could make us look like a more credible, viable source so that we could get into the bands and shows that we really wanted to cover. I mean, this was a real labor of love. We were going out to shows in these weird places about four to five nights a week and still working our day jobs on top of that. And as time went on, you know, we started to grow the site. We started shooting bigger venues with bigger bands. Our team grew to include more photographers and more writers, all who were happy to be contributing their works to this site in exchange for free press passes and front row access. We even started doing portrait sessions and interviews with some of the artists. I mean, how often do you get a chance to sit down and have tea with Moby and talk about Scrabble? Or sit in the green room at the House of Blues while the original lead singer from Guar smokes weed out of a Red Bull can? <laughs> Seriously happened. You know? Uh, how often do you get to walk around on a stage during the Silver Sun Pickup sound check, a stage where bands like the Pixies and Nine Inch Nails and Beck have all performed? Things were good, right? Things were great, and we were all getting better together. Our work was getting better, our photography, our writing, our team. Uh, but what never really occurred to me at the time was what I'd be able to do with a portfolio like this. I mean, really, anyone who says they're getting into music photography for the money is either crazy or latched on to some superstar bands. Um, it's hard enough out there for the musicians, let alone a, a new photographer, right? So I started selling prints at some of the local shops around town, which was cool, uh, and hanging, out, uh, hanging up photos in some of the restaurants and bars that were around. And it was fun to walk in and see the work up and see people you know, buy a Christmas gift for somebody, a little photo print or something. But this was all pretty small time, right? Until one day, I was getting lost, as I do, at uh, Lollapalooza in Chicago. Uh, I was waiting to meet some friends, and I started chatting up this other concert goer who was hanging out nearby. And the conversation was friendly and pretty short. And we agreed that smaller, more intimate venues are really our more preferred style for, uh, for seeing shows. I mean, really, who wants to see a band like the XX in the daylight in summertime at like 4 p.m.? It, it, it doesn't work. <coughs> Anyhow, I told her I was going to the Metro later that night, this iconic uh, venue up on the north side of Chicago in Wrigleyville. 
And uh, I was going to be photographing another one of my favorite bands, the Black Keys, which uh, we've, got a, we've got a couple of uh, giveaway photos later. So hey, I mean, for Q&A, we'll see. I hope you uh, start thinking. <laughs> So uh, I told her, though, I told her, I told her, hey, you know, you should go check out Lost in Concert uh, after, uh, after tonight. I'm going to be shooting this band. You know, she's like, oh, I love the Metro. And, and so I told her to check it out, gave her a business card. And, you know, that was the end of that. And I was hanging out with my friends the rest of the day, catching shows, uh, shot the Black Keys that night. And then, you know, a few days later, she writes me this email. And she's saying, oh, hey, thanks again for keeping me company at Lollapalooza, you know, while I was waiting for my friends. And thanks for, uh, you know, posting these photos and giving me the link, you know, really beautiful shots. And I'm thinking, oh, it's so nice of her to email me, right? Oh, what a, what a great human being. And um, before I even had a chance to reply and tell her that, she wrote me again saying, hey, you're not going to believe this, but a friend of mine from out of town just wrote me an email looking specifically for a Chicago-based music photographer to do some commercial work. And I'm thinking, what? Are you for real? <laughs> OK, giddy up. Let's do it. So she put us in touch. And uh, after some conversation, uh, this gentleman and I, we signed a contract to do some work. And some people might call this a lucky break, right? And that it was. But in my experience, luck is essentially a combination of preparedness, openness, and follow through. I had the portfolio. I was open to letting a complete stranger know about it. Uh, and I followed through with communications and eventually delivered on a project. Through this random connection, is this thing? OK, good. Through this random connection, I began working with Martin Audio, one of the largest speaker manufacturers in the world. Uh, they had me flying around to different cities, photographing shows with the Grammy award-winning Zac Brown Band, amongst a few other performers. And it was uh, pretty rad work. I honestly don't even really know that I can call it work. But they needed marketing materials for their campaign that hinged on this concept of the live music experience, right? Very similar to the work I'd already been doing with my passion project, Lost in Concert, uh, just slightly more focused on the speakers and crowds versus the bands. This, however, came with its own set of challenges. Now I'm juggling a day job, my passion project, serving on AIGA Chicago's board of directors at the time, uh, for this freelance work, and I guess the social life was kind of mixed in there sometimes, but not really. It was mostly just, mostly just work at that time. And something I didn't realize or put into context at the time that I do now is how this concept, right? Everyone's always talking about their work-life balance, right? It's such a big topic, but that's not right. That's not right at all. What if we start to approach this idea of a work-life blend, right? And choose to lessen how we distinguish all the differences between the two. We can find what's, what we're really meant to be doing professionally, which in turn can bring us a lot more happiness. And on the topic of happiness, you need to surround yourself with people that don't suck the life and energy out of you, OK? Like the succubus character from the TV show Lost Girl. There's going to be a lot of Lost references. Get ready. Uh, if you have an abundance of time and are into sci-fi fantasy, go ahead and check it out. But back to the struggling part of this story. All right, so one time I was on location in Orange County, California, capturing images with the Zac Brown Band and Martin Audio. And it was this bowl-shaped outdoor amphitheater, which was really cool, because we'd really be able to capture the fans and their energy uh, from the stage perspective, right? Really, really get that whole sense. And so the plan was for me to go and follow the band out as they were going on stage, follow the drummer out. And as the band was getting ready and the lights were up and the crowd's going ape shit, and the band's like, yeah, and I'm like right, right up on stage behind the drummer getting this like super wide angle shot kind of from this perspective. Uh, cool plan, right? Yeah. For whatever reason, though, Zach uh, comes up to me before the show this night. And I, I hadn't really talked to him much. He didn't really know who I was, I don't think. I was there with Martin, not really with the band, right? And uh, he comes up to me, and he shakes my hand. And he says, hey, brother, thanks for helping us keep bread on the table. And I'm, I'm thinking, my, what? that's the most Southern thing anyone's ever said to me. <laughs> But uh, I was, I mean, I think he had it backwards. I don't know if he knew that, but I, I wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't going to argue with him, you know? But like, all right, thanks, Zach. Yeah, great. All right, let's go, buddy. But uh, the challenging part of the story was really more about how I had to fly into uh, John Wayne Airport in Orange County on a Sunday at 1 p.m., then take a taxi right to the venue, shoot this show, and before the show was even over, take another taxi back to LAX just so that I could get back to Chicago to go back to my day job at 8 in the morning on Monday, right? Just enough time to have a shower and turn right around. Like I said, rest and sleep were a thing of the past. But this led to some other cool stuff. So another time, I was down in their hometown of Atlanta for this New Year's Eve concert. 
and this was the time that I seriously felt the most lost with this band. Lost in that surreal and wonderful kind of way though, right? After playing a sold out arena show at uh, the Phillips Center to ring in the new year, the bands and the crew all went to this super tiny after party uh, that was at the W Hotel. Uh, and Zach and the other musicians started playing songs. There was only like 50 of us at this, at this little tiny after party after playing that massive venue, right? It was crazy, it was half the people in this room. So they're playing Stone Temple Pilots and Smashing Pumpkins, and this is a country band. I'm not really into country that much, if you know me. But uh, when these guys started playing old 90s alt grunge, I was like, yeah, you know, I'm not even from Seattle, but I love alt grunge, you know? I'm from Chicago, but you know, we got Smashing Pumpkins there, that's cool. So uh, anyhow, anyhow, this, uh, seeing them in this environment gave me a view into them that I never really expected. And it made me understand that sometimes feeling lost in something is just the wonderful uh, disbelief that something so amazing in life is actually happening. And this led to doing work featuring the killers, uh, seen here, and uh, eventually photographing performances of uh, setup, uh, performances and teardown of the Oprah finale, which was at the United Center in Chicago. I had to be on set for four days, four straight days in a row, to document all of the setup uh, and, uh, and technical aspects of this insanely good speaker system. And if Oprah was using these speakers, it has to be good, right? I mean, she's not gonna use crap, of course. So thankfully, as I mentioned before, I had this job that was really supportive of life interrupting the work. The partners at the company agreed that it would be insane not to take these opportunities, and thank goodness they did, and thank goodness they valued this kind of stuff. Uh, it's just unfortunate that gigs like this only happen every so often, or I probably would have tried to make a go at this more full time. Even though they, uh, even though they, well actually that's, that's next year. This, this gig though, absolutely nuts. So like Beyonce and her, like working with her uh, backup dancers and their sweats and stuff and seeing Usher and Jamie Foxx and Stevie Wonder doing sound checks. Absolutely crazy. How could anyone not want to be doing this work all the time, right? I didn't want the good times to end. And starting a jazz band wasn't gonna be an option here. Lost in translation if you don't know the reference. Um, but like I mentioned, these gigs were uh, occasional at best. And uh, thankfully, I'd made a pretty good amount of money from some of these uh, jobs and it allowed me to grow my photography gear in a way that I would then be able to do other types of photography work that would be more sustainable uh, to, uh, to uh, like I look at what I do now with more portrait work and some other stuff. But anyways, after earning my chops with live music photography, I knew that other areas of photography were gonna be easily learned, and here's why. Live music photography, in my opinion, is the best boot camp for any aspiring photographer. At any given show, you're only given three songs to get the shot that you need. Uh, you can't use a flash, you have zero control over the lighting, you have no communication with your subjects. Sometimes you don't even know where you're gonna be able to stand. It's a totally arduous process that's full of unexpecteds. And it really doesn't pay much of a living wage since it's all in an editorial sense. Sure, sometimes you'll get an email from a magazine uh, with an offer to purchase some photos, and sometimes those photos can end up <laughs> on the cover of a magazine like, like acoustic guitar, which is cool, because it can make your mama proud, right? I think she's watching the live stream right now. Hi, mom. <laughs> but really, the team at Lost in Concert wasn't doing any of this because you know, we wanted uh, fame or money or anything like that. The team at Lost in Concert kept it running because we wanted to get lost in the moments, and we wanted to share that with other people. This was the type of thing that only this experience could give us. And you know, as time went on, more and more people kept asking, hey, how do I get, how do I get involved with Lost in Concert? Can I be a contributor? And thank goodness they were, they were coming to us because we were about to need it. So a few years into the project, we decided to produce something more tangible, something that would celebrate the work we'd been doing, something to encapsulate this idea of, these, of capturing these once-in-a-lifetime concert moments in photos and words. Uh, we teamed up with a really good friend of mine, Jen Soik, who I met thanks to the connectivity of AIGA's national network. She was living in Minneapolis at the time. Keep in mind, I'm still in Chicago. Uh, we worked with her to develop this 160-page book uh, celebrating Lost in Concert's formative years. Our hope was to leverage our personal and professional connections to create a really high-end product by launching this book through Kickstarter and getting people to help fund it prior to printing, right? And we, had, we were going, we were gonna blow out all the stops, like varnishes, 
uh, hand-applied, hand tipped-on stickers. And I mean, this was going to be a kick-ass book, right? A real timepiece, a coffee table book, a conversation starter. Your ticket, your backstage pass to all these formative shows in, that we had covered in Chicago. Unfortunately, our dreams of realizing the production of this book were about as real as the smoke monster from the TV show Lost. <laughs> it did not happen. This was a hard time, right? Especially for me. Uh, it felt like a massive failure. We only got about 30% uh, of the way through the funding. Now, granted, we asked for a lot of funding so we could print such a high-end book, but we were only selling them for 25 bucks a piece. All of that's in the details, though. Uh, I'd been putting tons of time into interviews and writing articles, uh, teaching uh, educational aspects of concert photography, all in hopes to get this Kickstarter campaign funded. And this failure caused a lot of tension amongst the formative team at Lost in Concert, all of whom were initially really good friends of mine before we went down the road of teaming up on a passion project. And as the failed Kickstarter campaign was coming to an end, some friendships were also over. Lost in Concert was at a point where we desperately needed more people to get involved. Danger, danger, right? No? Lost in Space, the original, though, not the remake. Although Netflix did a good job with that. Uh, so most of the original crew at this point had moved on to other pursuits or just plain burned out for one reason or another, right? We were all doing this in our free time. Nobody was really making any real money from the project directly, sure, indirectly, but while some friendships flourished during these years, other friendships faded away. And the addition of new blood and continual flow of new contributors, thankfully, showed me that it would be possible for this project to continue on as long as we had a few truly dedicated contributors. And the best part was, we could go anywhere the music was. So to date, Lost in Concert has covered hundreds of shows in more than a dozen cities across North America. Uh, we have active chapters with leading editors in multiple cities and are continuing to grow. I don't personally shoot that many shows these days. I find that working with the other editors and kind of giving them guidance and helping just promote the project at large to be very fulfilling. And I stay pretty active with other things too, AIGA and other organizations still. But we're always looking to give somebody that opportunity that they need to either start building or keep growing their portfolio. And it's really rewarding to see people who do contribute then go on to do other really great things. Most of us have seen a presentation or two about the importance of having a passion project, or what some people like to call their side hustle. And I had no idea that 10 years ago I'd be taking photos at an Andrew Bird concert and all of a sudden it would shoot me down this path to have all these experiences, right? Uh, that I'd get to have other experiences with musicians or sit backstage with somebody ever, that it would spark communities and provide opportunities for people I've never even, some people I've never even met, to, uh, to have the same experiences and to learn and grow. I don't know how long this will go on, but there's no clear end in sight. And I, I want to beg the question to you now, where are you going next? And do you really need to know? Stay open. Try to lose yourself in the wonderful possibilities that lie ahead. Don't be too rigid of it yourselves, you know? I don't know exactly where I'm going next, uh, but, I'm, but I have a pretty good feeling that I'm going to be getting lost a lot along the way. And for that, I'm very thankful. So, thank you. Yeah, let's do this Q&A. All right, but well, we're going to wait till we have everybody's attention so that we can hear all the questions. Do we have a mic that's going to be going around? Or I'll just repeat the questions, right? I'll, just, I'll be repeating the questions for our live stream. All right. Um, so no preference on who gets to ask questions first, but honestly, the first six are going to get a photo. So I'm going to go with this gentleman uh, right over here. Have you ever been rejected for having a conspicuously excellent camera with you? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the things that a lot of people uh, may not know, some people know for sure, I bet, but uh, most venues uh, and festivals don't allow DSLR cameras of any kind uh, to be allowed into, into venues. I think it's getting a little easier to sneak cameras in with the development of mirrorless technology, uh, even though they are still technically DSLR, or, you know, they're change interchangeable lenses. But uh, because they're a lot smaller, it's easier. But yeah, if you've got a, a camera that's the size of this table, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to get in, especially uh, when you're doing like a soundboard shoot or something from, uh, like, let's say the United Center, and you need a 400 millimeter prime, and it's literally this long. Uh, you know, you can't really sneak that in anywhere. <laughs> uh, good question, though. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's go uh, right there in the with the brown hair and the jean jacket. Yeah. <laughs> How did you stay motivated? Like, how did you not burn out on your passion? 
How do you stay motivated and not burn out? Well, that's a good question. I take breaks, actually. Um, I encourage people to take breaks all the time because burnout's a real thing. Um, it's The thing that actually burned me out more is uh, sometimes the complications of working with people can actually be more stressful and more exhaustive than doing the work itself, um, which is one of the things, one of the reasons I'm really happy to be in the position I am today of being able to work with and guide other people and sort of like prepare them for that and try to help them step off that ledge and walk them through. Uh, but in terms of, of burning out, I mean, when you're in the when you're in the pit at a show, it's an adrenaline rush. I mean, that is a that is a cool feeling when you have your elbows up on the show and somebody like Justin Hawkins from the Darkness is literally two feet from your face, like wailing on a guitar and a pair of leather suspenders. <laughs> like, it's rad. Uh, let's go with uh, John Barry. This is his first Creative Mornings. <laughs> Well, I went, I went, that's, I mean, sure. Uh, so the Andrew Bird show was more about like something that I thought would be fun to do, right? And then I realized that in order to be able to do it more full time, it was going to take more people in order to generate the kind of content that I needed in order to continue to do it for myself. So sure, there's some selfish reasons to get involved with something like that. But even when we do interviews with AIGA Seattle and we, people are trying to be on the board, you know, we ask them, you know, what's in it for you? There's always got to be some kind of selfish aspect, even a, a job that you apply for. You know, you're not doing it, oh, I want to just give my time to this company. No, you want a paycheck, right? <laughs> there's, there's always some kind of uh, self-reason. And if there's not, you won't continue to do it. But uh, as, as the team grew, it, it was very noticeable that we were able to be able to do more things. And for that, you know, then, then yeah, the we is inherent from then on. Oh my god, I love all these hands. <laughs> all right. Uh, let's, let's, I'm gonna, all right, right there. All right. Uh, two questions on opposite sides of the coin. OK. If you get yourself caught in a rut, how do you force yourself to get lost? OK. And has there ever been a time when you were so lost and you really didn't know how to dig yourself out of lostness? Sure, sure, sure. So uh, kind of a double entendre question here is our double-sided question. There's a, when, you're, when, you're in a, when you're in a rut, um, how, wait, can you repeat the first one again? Well, so, yeah, if you start doing the same thing over and over again, pretty soon it becomes sort of rote. Okay, so how, how do you beat the monotony of doing the same thing over and over? How do you force yourself into to looking at it with fresh eyes? Or how do you get fresh eyes? Sure, okay. Uh, well, I mean, we live in the, in the perfect place to uh, beat monotony. I mean, if, if you're, I, we're, we're, first off, I, I didn't say this in my talk, but it was a concept I almost went into, the idea of how people just get lost in their phones all through, you know? I can't tell you how many times I've seen people walk into shit uh, on the streets. I haven't owned a car for 13 years, so I'm always walking. I walked here today. And uh, props to Seattle Walk Report, too. I know she's in there. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, so hell yeah to the walkers out there. Um, but, you know, we, we live in this amazing place where we can go uh, you know, out to the mountains. Um, just last week when I was thinking about, like, how do I get lost prior to doing this talk, I went out to Lake Ingalls with a friend of mine and, and hiked that. And it was an insanely difficult hike. But when you, if you're, if, you're, if you're stuck and you can't stop thinking about all the billions of things that we're being forced digitally, like through our every device, uh, go somewhere where you can't have any of that, you know, and, and really reset. Uh, this is, I mean, if you're living in Seattle and you don't like the outdoors, there's probably a better place for you to live, to be totally <laughs> honest. Uh, this, is a, this is an amazing place to explore. And uh, so that, that's one way to get out of the rut. But otherwise, um, if, it's, if it's just getting over a creative hurdle, um, talking to friends about like what it is they're working on, Dr dial, into what, dial into a project somebody else is doing. Come into these events, for instance. Uh, maybe somebody, I hope somebody, at least one person I hope, is going to leave here today and be like, shit, that thing I've been thinking about doing, I'm going to do that thing now. I can totally do that thing, you know? And sometimes you just need to hear somebody else say that they're doing something to give you that extra boost to say, yeah, I can do that too. Awesome. Is that cool? All right, who's next? All right, uh, let's go right up front, because you got front row. Yes, um, so you lost connections with your friends with your Kickstarter project, and then uh, you probably regret it. And have you ever reconnected with the friendship, uh, with your friends? Okay, so, okay. Uh, lost connections with friends through the Kickstarter project. Possibly, he says, I, I do regret it. I actually don't regret it. 
Um, I uh, ha have I ever followed up with them again? Uh, uh, really, I, I keep in touch with a couple of them uh, a little bit, yeah. Uh, but uh, there's one that I that I definitely don't talk to anymore, um, and I regret nothing. Uh, <laughs> there is no room for people who are poisonous in our lives. So when you lose connections with people, there was more to it than just the fact that that Kickstarter failed is the reasons behind why it failed and the lack of energy some people put into the promotion of it and support of it that caused it to fail, in my opinion. Um, there, there, was, there was more to it though. People, some of the people who were contributing with the project uh, were going out to the shows, getting the press credentials, and then not generating the work. They were basically just partying. Uh, and that, that shit doesn't fly. You gotta do the work. You gotta, it's play hard, work hard. You know, you gotta do both. Good? Yeah, yeah rock and roll. <laughs> Anybody in the back? Uh, let's go glasses. Oh, no. Uh, yep, and then we'll go in front of you next. Yeah. Um, is, uh, Andrew Bird, is that the tour that, what? I'm sorry? Loney Deer. I, actually, I don't think they had an opener. It was. Um, can I can I draw, dial back? Or can I dial back on this? So I have that, the the ticket. Let's see. I gotta I gotta give me one second here. So the ticket from that show is actually the ticket that's in this presentation. I save all my concert tickets. Um, is that? Yeah. Okay. Cool. So it's um it's actually called the Gesellschaft concert. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Weird name, right? Uh, it's like this German word for like warmth and comfort. Uh, does anybody speak German? Because I might be off with that. Does anybody speak German in here? How, how close? What does that word mean? It's Dutch. It's Dutch. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm off. Uh, but I know it's not English, so we're getting pretty close. Uh. <laughs> but it's like a warmth and comfort, right? Like, but it means a lot of things. Okay. It means a lot of things. It may be a Dutch word. Um, it sounds like it is a Dutch word. I'm going to trust him because I, I don't know. Uh, but but uh, so I don't know that there was an opener for that concert, but it was this. Um, he, he, Andrew Bird does these regularly in Chicago because he's from the Chicagoland area, and uh, he or not regularly but annually, and it was like three nights in a row where he basically is uh, this very comfort warm sort of like it's supposed to like make you feel good, feel like you're in the holiday spirit kind of thing, you know? All right, cool, cool. All right, uh, right in front uh, there. This is actually oh, no, no, sorry, sorry. Um, uh, in front of the gentleman who asked the last question. I'm sorry, I should have been more specific with that. Um, what got you so lost to bring from Chicago to Seattle? And are you still active in the music scene? What's your favorite OK. Um, getting lost, moving from Chicago to Seattle. That was actually just a, a random stroke of luck and opportunity. Uh, I happened to be living with someone at the time who got a job at Amazon. So made that move together. I thought, hey, if I'm ever going to relocate to a cool place like Seattle, why not get some other company to pay for it and not have the golden handcuffs? <laughs> right? I mean, that's winning. So um, and, and favorite venues? Yeah, Seattle's got some cool venues. Uh, I'm still kind of partial to the Chicago scene in, for, in terms of music. Uh, but my favorite venues in town here locally would be uh, Showbox and The Market. Thank God they did not tear that down. Save our Showbox. Absolutely, I'm big, big into that. Um, you know, Numos is pretty rad too. If you're looking to like get right up, kind of close to the stage, and feel like you're part of the show, I just saw Mother Mother there. Uh, this Canadian band uh, from uh, Vancouver. They're awesome too. If you haven't seen them, go check them out. Um, but yeah, as uh, those are probably my top two. Yeah, cool. Uh, let's go in the front then. Yeah, this is their question. I, nope. I know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> What's wrong with country music? What's wrong with country music? All right, all right, here you go. I got, I got an answer for that. Oh, no, really? All right, we're going to do one, one more after this. So whoever, whoever like, really raises their hand the highest is going to get picked. Okay, but, okay so the, what's wrong with country music? Well, nothing's necessarily wrong with it. I just haven't been very partial to it for a very long time. But I'll tell you what, uh, seeing a band like Zac Brown play live, I'll go, I actually have paid money to go see them live uh, since the work I've done with them. I've seen them probably about a dozen times now. And uh, they, they, cause they'll, they, they are just super talented musicians. They play uh, Metallica covers, uh, Elton John covers. The, they play everything, man. They're crazy. But country in general is all about crying, dying, or going someplace, right? And there's oftentimes a pickup truck and a dog. So, I mean, un unlike, unlike going on cruises, which are all about, like, you know, they're all for the, uh, what is it, the nearly dead, the newly wed, and the overfed? <laughs> Anyways. All right. One, one more. We have one time for one more question. Uh, all right. In the back there. They're pretty high up.
Sure. Okay. So how much did the uh, how much did my work with uh, the design agency in Chicago and my work with AIGA impact the success of Lost in Concert? Um, well, I don't know that it necessarily made a direct impact on Lost in Concert. However, I have been able to uh, find more connections in other cities through the national connectivity of AIGA. Uh, thanks to its 74 plus chapters around the country, uh, there's a lot of people that I have direct access to. I actually still work with them on a national level as part of their chapter advisory council. And I work with chapters in the Midwest specifically. So recently I was just in um, Minnesota for their uh, AIGA design camp, which they've been running annually for 40 years. And they, uh, I met a, a young man named Jake who's going to be starting a chapter in Minneapolis uh, in, the, in the coming weeks here. We're working on getting him set up now. And so it's just, so that kind of connectivity has been a, a huge help, a huge success. Um, I would say that in terms of McGuffin Creative Group and working there for the eight years that I was there, their just general support of seeing, like I said in the presentation, how our, how our uh, personal lives really impact our work and our design lives and being supportive of that. Um, it's something that I, I know now like, and I truly believe in is um, as a designer or any creative, all of our work is directly um, you know, spawned or derived from the experiences that we have. And if you can have more experiences, you can have a broader place to draw from in your work without having to scour dribble or something, you know. It's like, go and live and have, have experiences, live your life and draw from that. If you want to, I mean, they talk about ethnography and the idea of studying people and being in the situation that people are going to be in as you approach uh, something that you're creating. And if you can actually get into that situation, it can, you know, just live, be in as many situations as you can, and it'll, you'll have more of that background to draw from. Yeah. Cool. That seemed like an intelligent answer for the last question. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>